Good evening and welcome to the closing session of this year's knowledge series. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, The Revenant, Cloud Atlas, Assassin's Creed, and before I start gushing, the list is daunting and endless. Each film stuns the senses with its sheer visual expanse and the sweeping scale of its storytelling. But each film also hides some simple truths, a very rooted tale, and a theme that filters down across cultures and beliefs. And therein lies the essence of his filmography. Universality of theme and the epic narrative structure are recurrent topics in any cinema forum and need to be revisited time and again especially in these days of easily accessible, fast-evolving technology and the excessive obsession with form and style. Yet what would be of extreme importance is the rooted nature of the tale, and that's some great creative producing. This masterclass attempts to explore the producer's checklist, really, as he mounts and positions the epic across the cultures. Would like to welcome the producer of these big epics, I hope in an epic session, Philip Lee. May I please ask you to come up? And he will be in conversation with Nyai Bhushan, India correspondent, Hollywood reporter. Over to you, Nyai. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to the concluding session of the Knowledge Series this year at the Bazaar. Um, Larger than life, uh, grand, monumental, iconic. Now, these are the words that I think, or some of the words that you could rightly use to describe the filmography of Philip Lee, uh, given the kind of projects that he's been associated with. And as executive producer, his credits include the Oscar winning The Revenant, Cloud Atlas, and the upcoming Assassin's Creed, which opens in December. Uh, Philip's enviable range of films uh, cross from China to Hollywood, from East to West. And uh, his earlier credits as an associate pre uh, producer or line producer include uh, classics like Chen Kei's uh, The Emperor and the Assassin, Ang Lee's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Yang uh, Zhang Yimou's Hero, and uh, Chris Nolan's The Dark Knight, among others. Uh, Philip has actually taken his experience and a step forward, and uh, with his longtime producing partner, Marcus Barmettler, they've just launched a financing and production company, Facing East Entertainment, that was launched at Cannes this year, you said, uh, which is currently producing uh, Peter Siegel's science fiction action title, Inversion, which also stars Samuel Jackson, and it is scripted by Paul Haggis. And uh, Facing East is developing another sci-fi project, Chip Breaker, which is going to be directed by Paul. Uh, Mr. Lee holds a Bachelor of Arts from the College of Arts at Nihon University in Japan and a Master of Fine Arts in Producing from the American Film Institute and a Doctorate in Business Administration from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So given his rich filmography and experience, uh, it is no surprise why this session is titled Mounting and Positioning the Epic Across Cultures. Welcome, Mr. Lee. Welcome to India. Oh, thank you for having me A big me round here. of applause for Mr. Lee again, please. <clears throat> so to uh, start off, uh, of course your filmography is uh, highlighted by major epics and big budget productions. So to start off, are you naturally drawn to such stories which end up as large scale projects? Well, actually, um, when I started uh, my career in my early days, you know, a lot of projects, they come to me. I have been line producing or production management a lot of uh, Hollywood films. So then uh, they come to me. And I think over the years I, I've been working in Hollywood film from a production assistant and then to a uh, prop buyers, you know. So it took me a, a few years before I become a production manager. And then later, you know, whenever there were uh, big projects go to Asia, they, you know, Always, I'm the first one people call. They want me to line produce uh, their movies. So um, the last one I line produced was the uh, the Dark Knight, the Hong Kong portion. So after that one, you know, I think it's t it's time for me to move on to do something that I always wanted to do. So uh, it is actually um, it's not necessary all big project. 
but the kind of project that I want to do, uh, they are in a kind of a bigger scale. But it is not also 100% correct, you know. I recently, I have involved uh, Talens Malik's uh, upcoming movie called The Regnum that was shot in Berlin uh, and, and Spain, right? So that was not a very big project. But when I look at it, you know, for me, is uh, big is not the reason I want to do a project. The, the, the reason I want to do the project is because I like them. And then just it happens a lot of them, they are big. So that's pretty much, you know, I think, you know, to answer your question, I just want to do the project that I believe in and I want to do it. So either they are big or small. Uh, you know, just looking at the way you started your career, as you just mentioned, uh, that uh, you were doing Hong Kong line production for some Hollywood films like uh, A Dragon, The Bruce Lee Story, and even Double Impact, and all the way till The Dark Knight, and so on. So, uh, what did you learn from those early experiences, you know, interacting with international productions and Hollywood production? And then, how did that come in handy as uh, your career evolved towards producing uh, projects that really sort of travel between East and West? So the experiences of those early days being, you know, associated with international films? Well, well, I think one of the key things is that uh, Hollywood movie in general, they are very well prepared. They have everything well prepared. They go to the location and basically just shoot. And then, you know, when I work on some Hong, uh, Chinese movie, right? So the shooting day is hundreds some days, you know? So for, for a foreign film, it's unbelievable. Why you have to spend, you know, shoot, you know, 100 and, you know, 10 days, you know. So in, in a big movie like, for example, like Inversion, we are only talking about seven days of sh shoot, 70 days shooting. So I think when the early days, when I started, I went to school in Japan in the 80s. So a lot of uh, Hong Kong filmmakers, they went to uh, 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 Tokyo and they shoot. A lot of time they call me, they know that I'm here. That's not a lot of... Uh, a Hong Kong student in, in Japan at the time, so I know many of them. One day I follow a, you know, because at that time I still, I'm not that experienced about filmmaking. So I follow them to the location, right? Then I, on this, in the van, I saw a piece of paper. So I, I, I pick it up and they said that is the script for today. So it is it, it, it just that, you know, I, I think that I have to decide what exactly what I, what I want to do. So I know making Hong Kong movie is not something that, you know, fit my character or training. So I, I, think, I, I think the preparation is, is very important. But also at the same time, I learned something over the years working with uh, 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 U.S. Hollywood production. They always have a stereotype of uh, Asian characters, Asian story, Asian how Asian women looks, which I don't really agree at the time. But I'm not really the one who tell the director what to do, until in 1993 when I work on Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. So the director Rob Cole had become a very good friend of mine. So he he, he gave me the script. He wanted me to give me uh, give him the my my honest opinion. So I gave him a lot of my opinion, and then he changed it. So we become very good friends. And as a matter of fact, he was the one who organized my study in the USA. So he said, you know, Hong Kong is just too small for you. You should go uh, somewhere to the United States. So Rob was the one who organized my, um, you know, study in the US. So what, what I want to say is that working with the uh, Hollywood firm for so many years, it's really helped me to understand and the both culture. And you know, I, I can give you more experience, uh, uh, you know, example later on, yeah. You know, talking about how you sort of ended up connecting cultures, I think that's uh, the sort of takeaway from your experience that how uh, you ended up being at the intersection of East and West. And as you rightly said, that you wanted to counter the stereotypical view that Hollywood usually has, or Western films usually have of Asia. Now, looking the other way around, like what kind of films from other cultures have inspired you? Uh, I know you've said that uh, you've liked the work of M. Night Shyamalan, who did The Sixth Sense, though he's an American director, but he's of Indian origin. So uh, just to take some examples, if you can share, 
or films from other cultures that have inspired you the other way around? Well, for me, is because I, I went to Japan to study because I like, always like Japanese film. I always like uh, Kurosawa, I like Ozu Yasuhiro, right? But when I was in Japan, I studied, I watched a lot of uh, Italian movie, and I like Italian movie because I like the family value, friendship, you know, movie like Bicycle Thief, you know, Once Upon a Time in America, you know, and even two nights ago, I was watching Godfather 2. I think they are still very good movies, you know. For, for Sixth Sense, for example, I, I, I think Sixth Sense at that time was a very good example, even up to this moment, because for Chinese, we understand, you know, for example, somebody died, we believe, yeah, somebody died, and all of a sudden, without any preparation, and most likely the body is dead, but that, yeah, the soul is still something around. So, but this is something that is totally foreign to the, you know, foreign audience. I think the director who is an Indian, you know, but living in the U.S., right? So it's very smart to find something that is, uh, every Indian knows about it, or maybe every Asian knows about it, but then the international audience, they don't necessarily knew about it. But then he just, he tell this story. It become very interesting and exciting, and yet is understandable by the end of the movie. So I think that is very exciting. It's a, still a very good example for me. Yeah. Just to take this point further, do you think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, naturally speaking, you would like these kind of philosophies which are sort of Asian to come across in films which are international? Is that, yes. you like that sort of yes. concept? You know, I don't know um, if any of you know this uh, a Japanese uh, writer. His name is Mishima Yukio. Mishima is the one who, who killed himself after he finished this book, The Sea of Fatality. This is a book about in reincarnation. Reincarnation. Uh, re reincarnation. And I tried to get the rights of this book together with my friend, the producer of Titanic. That was like 15 or maybe even longer. So it was very difficult negotiation. But one thing, the agent of the Mishima uh, family Ask me one question. You know, up to this moment, I'm still thinking about it. Is that, do you think the international audience understand the concept of, of reincarnation? To me, actually, reincarnation, I always believe, you know? So that's why we have to be careful. We have to be a nice person in this life. Because otherwise, you know, next, next life. So, but is there something that people, they don't, you know, the, Western audience, they don't know about it. I do believe they don't know about it. But yes, if we find the right angle, right vehicle to tell them about this culture, this uh, thinkings that we, our culture has, you know, including Indian, right? So when I encounter Cloud Atlas, this is a story also about kind of a reincarnation. I fell in love with that. So I think this is the kind of thing, sorry that I still want to do, you know, with different culture. That's why, uh, for example, I come here, I start to think about what sort, of, what sort of Indian culture that could be interesting for me, but yet not necessarily everybody understand. So maybe before I wanted to share that with other culture, I have to understand more of myself first. You know, uh to take examples of how you're drawn to projects as we were discussing. So for instance, of course, the, the one uh, new film that everybody has seen, your, your, one of your latest productions, of course, has been last year's The Revenant. And uh, in a way, if you look at the character, The Revenant, he really gets reincarnated. He's almost dead, you know, and then he almost has a rebirth in, in, in that same story. So what convinced you about that particular film, number one. And number two, uh, you know, what sort of convinced you to sort of also raise part financing for that film, which ended up being partly financed with uh, Chinese money and Asian money. So to look at both the creative and commercial side of your involvement with The Revenant. Well, I, I have to admit, my involvement in The Revenant is basically is only the financial. So uh, when I knew about the project, you know, I think I always want to get involved because I like Birdman a lot. 
Birdman is a very interesting movie. I found it so exciting. I haven't seen so exciting movie for a long time. So the Revenant is that I read the script. It's a very powerful script. You know, it's a, I was uh, even I feel the pain when I read the script. So, but then it seems that the budget is very high. It, it, you just don't understand for a movie like that how come it is so high. So that, but then I realized that it's a, with uh, uh, DiCaprio is an actor, with Tom Hardy is an actor. So my, my, at that time, I basically approached the uh, producer at the Regency with my partner. So I think I can help, you know, we can help to raise some funding in Asia to help release the burden, the tension of the financial situation. So of course, you know, because the market in China is getting bigger and bigger, and they love this idea. But it, it's not an easy task for me, you know, to go out to other investors to convince them this is a viable project. Because they said, okay, with DiCaprio is good, but Irari to never direct a movie more than $30 million. This is more than 100 million, right? So how is it, does not make sense. So for me, when I look at this project, and basically for, you know, uh, it's very simple. It's really the director and the actor to me. If it is not DiCaprio, it will not sell the movie. I do believe he is pretty much one of the only actors that he, they still have the star power nowadays. So eventually, I convinced one company, one guy, you know, one company, that they are not really in the industry but they have a lot of money. I convince them that they are intangible value, value uh, if they invest this movie because it will bring them something intangible. So this, this was a Chinese company? Yeah, this is a Chinese company. And they're company. into what kind of business? They were into some well, other they business? Are, they are in the uh, toys company. A toy, 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 toy company. company. Okay. So at the end, you know, of course, you know, the, the, the the first time they invest in movie, right? So the movie get 11 Oscar nomination and the stock goes up, you know, and there are people, you know, invest their, you know, hundreds of million dollars, you know, uh, actually a lot of money to invest in their film division. Whether the film division can do well or not, I don't know. But actually it's really bring them intangible, you know, uh, uh, value. For myself, I believe this mo movie will bring me something too. So, of course, you know, this a, end up is a $150 million movie. But by the end of the day, because it grows pretty much $600 million over, internationally, so worldwide. So I think somehow I was able to make some money and at the same time I got involved with this project. So it, it also, I think it's a, it's a very, um, uh, uh, good decision, you know, to push myself into this movie. So, uh, out of the $150 million budget for The Revenant, how much of it was raised by you uh, uh, from your Asian investors? Well, actually, I cannot, you know, exactly tell you, but a very substantial amount. Okay. Yeah. Which shows that how Chinese money is getting very active yes. in Hollywood. Yes. As yes. Just a couple yes. of weeks ago, Wanda Group has just invested a billion dollars and so on. Yes, yes. So it just shows how money is traveling from east to west. Yes. So now, you know, everybody is quite well aware of your, uh, the films that you have done. And uh, it goes without saying that your career has seen you interacted with, with uh, some of the leading masters of, of today's cinema, you know. So I think it would be great if you can just go through your experiences uh, with and your learnings from directors such as Ang Lee, Zhang Yimou, Chen Kege, and so on through your films. Uh, and we can go by one by one. Uh, uh, we can show a clip from a film, and then maybe you can share your uh, lessons of the experiences when you were making that film. Yes, I, I think in my career, I have the luxury to work with extremely interesting filmmakers. You know, what, uh, you know, the Chinese director, like Zhang Yimou, Chen Kelke, Ang Lee, and also Ronnie Yu, they're very good director. And other than Chris Nolan, uh, David Cronenberg, you know, Wachowski, you know, Tom Tickwell, and, and I just did that movie with Tom, uh, and Talents Malik. But I think every director have their, you know, very interesting. 
because I was trained as a director. You know, I know to a certain extent, director, they have some sort of a very special quality. You know, how you gain their trust, then they become friends of you and share ideas with you and trust you. This is something that is, uh, I, I found that I'm, so far I, I'm, I'm doing quite well because I know what a director normally think, I think, because I was trained as a director. So why don't we just start it? Maybe I, I want to show you the, 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 uh, the little clip of uh, the trailer uh, of a film movie that I work on, then I'll talk, I'll share my experience with you. The first one is uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. of eternal beauty and infinite mystery, a legend was born. The story of a warrior, the woman he loved, a daring outlaw. and a princess destined to become a warrior. Classics proudly presents Chao Yun-Fat, Michelle Yeoh, Zhang Ziyi in an extraordinary romantic adventure. From Ang Lee, the director of Sense and Sensibility, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's, I, I still have to say this is still a very good movie. Oh I, yeah, I, that's an understatement. <laughs> I, I actually have some sort of uh, involvement in terms of creativity. And um, I was the one who recommend Peter Bao as the uh, DP, as the cameraman. And Peter is a very talented person, but Peter is not necessary very easy to work with from a lot of people's point of view because Peter is educated in the US but he worked in Hong Kong. He has it very demanding, not a lot of people want him, you know. But I, I like Peter's work, so I recommend Peter to us pretty much much very last stage of our production. And I also together we I I, I did all the casting section the main cast section, including the, the female lead with uh, the Zhang Ziyi with Ang Lee. So we talk a lot about cast. But the, the, the thing that I involve is actually the last see, uh, the scene that you see about this uh, flying in bamboo. I was the one who really support to do this sequence because not, the, not that many colleagues in our team wants to do this because they think that how could the people find the bamboo, you know? But for me, and I, Ang, and I, I share Ang's vision, is that uh, it's a very poetic. It does not need to be true. I certain, in certain part of filmmaking, we have to have the liberty to become creative and to be a little bit crazy, something I believe. So at that time, I was the one who in, in charge of all the money issue. So that's, that's the reason eventually that, that scene get made. I, I really support that, you know. It, it was a very difficult scene to make. So, Working with Ang, it, it, my, the way I look at it, uh, Ang is a very hardworking guy. You know, we ha we are shoot we shoot two units, right? The second unit with the fight sequence is uh, we have an action choreographer Yun Wo Peng who did Matrix and very famous guy. But every day, actually, Ang when he finished the first unit, and he always go to the second unit. A lot of idea about the action, although he did not take the credit. A lot of them is, was his ideas, right? But what I learned from 
Ang is that it's very different from a lot of Chinese director I work with. Ang Lee is very open. He's very open. He always asks people about opinions, how things go, you know, whether it looks good or, or how the story, what is it about it. He always asks opinion. I'm sure he only asks the people that he, 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 he trusts. And, and as a matter of fact, Ang is a very stubborn person. He knows exactly what he wants. But he wants to ask you and give an opportunity for you and for himself whether or not your answer, your opinion is better than his. So if your opinion is better than his, he will use it. Otherwise, he will use his own idea, you know, opinion. Because by the end of the day, he is still the director. So he is very open, unlike a lot of Chinese directors that I work with. You know, they go to the set like a king. Nobody really wants to dare to tell them. So that is something about Ang Lee. And, and then, you know, Ang has been doing different kind of movie. At that time, you know, we have that conversation. I think he's very lucky because he has the luxury to do whatever he wants to do. So he never repeat himself. This is something that he found filmmaking is so exciting. And for this, actually, is also inspired me. I always try, this day, I don't, I don't want to repeat myself. I always want to look for something more interesting. That is the kind of uh, interaction I have with Ang Lee up to this moment. Yeah. Uh, it's been more than a decade since this film came out, uh, Crouching Tiger. And as you said, like, if you, as the producer, when you see it again, and uh, you, know, you say that it really is one of your best work, and the audience still also has that connect with the film, uh, was there anything when you were making the film that sort of gave you a sort of a feeling that what you were making is something quite unique. Of course, everybody remembers those famous bamboo uh, sequences, but when you were making it, when you were on set, when you were having the creative meetings with Ang Lee, did, you, did all of you sort of have this feeling that this was something else? Because it, it changed uh, the perception of not just Chinese cinema, but just Asia in Hollywood, you know, and worldwide, of course. Oh, yeah. I, I, that I'm very excited to talk about this. After, when I first read the script, I said, ah, oh, we're going to Oscar. Oh, as simple as that. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, I have that sort of a sensibility, and that is something that I keep believing I have. And said, oh, yeah, you know, Ang Lee is a very humble guy, right? <sighs> you know, so that, so I was right. Then after we went to the Golden Horse of what? We got a few Golden Horse. I said, Ang, see you in Oscar. He said, ah, you know. <laughs> so I, I sent him to the airport, right? So, you know, we got 10 nominations. I got crazy, you know. I was, we were in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the restaurant in Hong Kong. And at that time, there is no broadcast. We just have a friend in Los Angeles watching <laughs> TV phone. and tell us, blah, 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 who is that? And then the guy said, oh, Peter Bao, is you, you have nomination. Well, Peter Bao was so excited. <laughs> so that was a very wonderful moment. So, I mean, that shit says that, you know, if it's, as they say in Hollywood or in, in the world of theater and everything, if it's great on the page, it's great on the stage. So in that case, maybe the script was like that, that you were convinced just at the scripting stage that this was something special. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, today I want to show another clip, is The Emperor and the Assassin. I have another story, but a different one. But unfortunately, the clip is not good enough, so I will save it some other time. Yeah, we'll do yeah. another master class on that one. <laughs> no. So let's show uh, Hero. Hero, yeah, we move to Hero, uh, right. Zhang uh, Zimu. soldier with no name, a warrior with supernatural skill, and no fear. On a mission of revenge against the army that massacred his people. the wrong things right, he must take on the Empire's most ruthless assassins and be 
reach the enemy he has sworn to defeat. I mean, this film, you know, is just visual poetry. You know, I think it, it just defined that phrase, visual poetry. As, as, as I'm just speaking for myself. So, uh, how was it for you? Uh, as well, I, I still remember the day that I got the script is that, uh, you know, uh, Bill Kong, he's the real producer of these two movies. So, he sent me, I was teaching at university at that time. So, after we have dinner with Zhang Yimou, and then he drove me, uh, uh, Bill Kong drove me back to my university quarter and he gave me the script. He said, oh, this is uh, the script that Zhang Yimou wants to do, you know. So I read the script. The script is actually is nothing really special, you know. From, from my point of view, it's pretty much like a Rosamund, you know. So everybody has their own story, so which is good. But, but the story itself is not, you know, super exciting for me. But I visualize that because Zhang Yimou is Zhang Yimou, he's, very, he's a very strong visual artist. So I can, realize, I can visualize this uh, uh, project. I, I work with Zhang Yimou quite a bit, and particularly uh, during the post. We, were sp we spent some time in, the, in, the, in Australia talking about the story. And basically, they are, you know, I have to say they are certain director, they, someone, they concentrate with the story. There's someone, they concentrate in the visual, you know. So, going back, you know, the, 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 the uh, computer graphics, that I have, you know, because on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I went to a place in Los Angeles. Because I don't, I don't believe, yeah, I'm same, same as Ang, right? Asian company. You know, this is a Chinese movie, but Asian uh, computer graphic company would not be, it's not that great. But you see, as a matter of fact, on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, there was a lot of uh, visual effects. It's a kind of visual effect that you don't see. It makes it so natural. And Hero is a totally different. It's a lot of vi very uh, strong visual stuff. So the company worked with us on uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, but after Crouching Tiger, they, they, the first project, uh, I went to them because they, they, they did Matrix. So I went to them that I don't have that sort of money. I only have this. <laughs> so I have so many, many to do, things to do. But they read the script, they loved it. So they decided to do it. Of course, you know, afterwards, you know, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, a little bit later, they bankrupt. You know? <laughs> so we cannot go back to them again. Then on Hero, I went to Australia. <laughs> that is the reality of the VFX business. I think the VFX well, you business know, I is... have to, as a producer, I have to do best to charm them. Why you have to do it, right? So it's not because of us, because of a bad management. No, because actually the reason is the key uh, visual effects supervisor has set up his own company to do Matrix 2 and 3. <laughs> so that's why the, the outlaw business. So, I, I talked to the um, uh, uh, visual effects house in Australia and the post house in Australia because I negotiate all this. In, 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 in this uh, hero crew, not that many people speak English, right? It's a very totally Chinese production. So I organized the, uh, the, the post in Australia. So I spent lot, quite some time with, you know, with its uh, 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 animal logic. Animal logic. So I, I talked to uh, Zhang Yimou quite a bit. So I understand where he is coming from is actually very different with other director. As I mentioned, they said, with all my respect, you know, his concentration is the visual, not necessarily the story. So for someone like myself, because we went to school, film school in the overseas, in, in, I went to AFI, right? So for us, the first thing is story. 
The second thing is story. The third thing is also story. So it's a little bit different. So that's what I learned, you know. Of course, I'm very proud that the movie get nominated for Best Foreign Film again, right? So that's pretty much, you know. But I have to say, technically, this hero is, you know, become the kind of a standard of a Chinese movie. And that was the biggest movie ever in China at that time. So, you know, that's my experience working with a vis visual director. Yeah, because uh, it's very difficult to sort of uh, believe that uh, uh, if, if, as you said, that the story may not have been that strong, but just the sheer power of visuals can attract a whole new audience, not just in Asia, but I think it crossed over very well. And that's why Quentin Tarantino presented it. So, uh, uh, how did he get involved? Uh, how That's a long story. Yeah, but just because well, you know, we're all the, fans the of both of them. Yeah. The story is that our, uh, our investor, you know, on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sony Classic, you know, did the movie. Yeah. And then Weinstein was very upset that he did not do it. So, from that onward, he basically bought all the right for all the Chinese movie, I heard, including Hero paid a lot of money. But after the movie released in China, I understand he did not like it. He shouted for a little while. So until, until Tarantino went there and talked to him, and somehow they added a little bit, you know, so they got released a little bit later. It's not the kind of release date that we want, but the movie made $50 million in, in, in the US. It's actually quite good. Yeah, sure. So I'm sure Weinstein must have been happy at the end of it. <laughs> Okay, so now we move on to your next film. Yeah. Okay, this is another movie that actually uh, I have a lot to share with you. Uh, it's a David Cronenberg's uh, movie called M Butterfly. After a century of foreign influence, Asia was about to reclaim herself. The Red Guard has emerged as a genuinely potent reactionary political force which will seize upon any excuse to justify the expulsion of all foreigners from China. Onto this immense stage came a diplomat with a romantic vision. I, René Gallimard, have known and been loved by the perfect woman. And a performer who brought his fantasy to life. This was a world that can never be revisited. From director David Cronenberg comes an epic story of love and its power to deceive. Last Emperor's John Lone. Nothing blinds a man to reality like perfect love. The prosecution claims Monsieur Gallimard was fully aware of the implications of his espionage activities. Oh. <laughs> Inspired by the true story and based on the Tony Award winning play, M. Butterfly. Can, can I ask how many of you have seen this movie? You see, that's very, you know, not a lot. Let me just tell you, that was 1992. Yeah. You know, I got a call, you know, that uh, David Cronenberg need to do a movie in China. Then at the time, you know, I, I really loved to work with David Cronenberg. But then my wife was pregnant at that time. So I have to go to China for a long time. So I told my wife, you know, this is the director I really want to work with. And also with Jeremy Irons, he's, the, he's a wonderful actor. I, because I always like David Cronenberg's movie. If you have seen, you know, David Cronenberg's movie, that Jeremy Irons always there, you know. So I, I like a lot. So, but um, because when my wife was pregnant, so I have to negotiate with my wife, you know, so I have to go out for a, long, a few months. So. I have to say, when I read the script, that was one of the best films I ever read. 
you know, it was written by David Henry Wong. Right? So with David Cronenberg, what a dream. Yeah? So then we started to prep, you know, we don't have an actor, to, actress to play the female role, which actually in the movie is a female, but actually it's a man. We could not find anybody, right? They, they, the, they, don't, find any, they don't have anybody, so they asked me, right? I said, there's only two persons in this world could do this. And one is Leslie Cheung, and the other one is John Long. But I think John Long, John is a good friend. I worked with John after he did um, The Last Emperor, and we, be, we play Mahjong every day, right? But he's, he's very bad in Mahjong. When he lose, he got very angry, you know. <laughs> so, but there is an actor, there was an actor called Leslie Cheung. I don't know if anybody knows who Leslie Chong is, yeah? He was the actor who played uh, Farewell, My Concubine. He's very, he, he, he passed away a long time ago, but he's so beautiful. So he, because at that time I saw a movie, pretty much at the same time called The Crying Games. I, you know, The Crying Game is about, you know, these ladies, you know. Actually, we, I went to see the movie, I was totally unaware that in, as a matter of fact, he was a man. So there is one shot that you see the guy's head and then the, the camera still panned down and you see his sex organs. You know, I was shocked, you know. But I want that sort of, a, in the, this story, it should be like that, right? So Leslie Chung was a very big, you know, act, actor at the time. So nobody really could reach him, but he was shooting Farewell My Concubine in Beijing. So I know Chen Kai Ge very well before I worked with him a few years later because when he did his first movie, I helped him to get the Panavision camera for free. Yeah, that's we, did, did he helped me. So eventually we get hold of Leslie, right? So Leslie is a superstar in Asia. He, does not, he did not want to be cast, do any casting section. The only thing is the producer, they went to uh, Beijing and just sit down with him and have coffee with him and he allowed, it, he allowed it her to take video. So by the end of the day, for me, this is a perfect role for Leslie. You know? But then at the end, they, uh, they choose uh, uh, John Long. Warner Brothers choose John Long. The reason is that this is a big movie. It's quite big at that time. And that sort of investment, you have to have a named actor. The only actors that they famous was John Long, right? So they decided to uh, work with John Long. Well, I don't really like it. I asked David, you know, I said, what, what do you think about John? You know, for us, being an Asian, John is a very handsome guy. But he looks terrible as a woman. That's from my culture. But then when I asked David, David said, oh, he, he looks beautiful. So I, I, what I want to say is a different culture. But what I want to tell you to share my experience is my conversation with, John, uh, with David Cronenberg. I said, David, the script does not make sense. I said, I, I really, actually, I'm a very good friend. I said, I said, David, the script does not make sense. They've been living for seven years together. There are many sex scenes, you know, in the movie. How come they, uh, Jeremy Irons does not know the, the guy, who, the woman she's been sleeping every night is a man? You know how he told me? I tell you, up to this moment, I think that is something very creative. He said, what makes you think that he does not know that he is not a woman? You understand what I'm trying to say? Because I think you, when you think about it, this is very David Cronenberg. If you look at all his movies about sexuals and all this stuff, this is his. I, I have to say, David Cronenberg is the lovely, one of the most lovely person I ever worked with. He made great movies, many of them, but unfortunately, I have the pleasure to work with him, but that is most likely one of his not that great movies. So that's pretty much my experience with, with, with David So Conor basically Bird. what you're trying to say is that, you know, they say that in the film business it's all about suspension of disbelief. 
you know that is a, a sort of a term that is used in the film business that you sort of convince the audience into something that is really not possible but they still buy it so uh, david i think took that a bit further isn't it that uh, a woman uh, played by a man is probably the ultimate in suspension of disbelief so uh, what does that tell you about david's uh, creative process in terms of the way he thinks you know in terms of how he convinced the producer that it's okay to do it like this i am i am only the production manager you know so david griffin you know warner brother they are the producers they believe in david i only i was there to help out the shooting for me i learned a lot from david how he how he work with actors you know very quiet very quiet you don't no one listen you don't know and he when he he works you know he have everything cover his his head with a monitor you don't know what he's thinking but he has his way but just very calm and talk to actors i i would love to work with david again you know so I, another thing i want to say just a few months ago uh, i i met david henry henry wong in the, in in new york and he said he's going to do this movie again he wants to do this again Remake, because yeah. he has to write i have to say this is a very powerful story but imagine in 1993 we were able to make this movie in china that's amazing yeah, there's course. a lot of politics about cultural revolution and also about uh, uh, the gay issue but there's another story yeah of course because as i was actually about to take it to that point that in this day and context when hollywood and china are coming so close together when uh, uh, you know chinese films uh, chinese money is investing in hollywood and so on so in this new atmosphere uh, how do you see this film again you know both the version that you worked on and possibly the remake uh, do you see a difference in approach and how times have changed well i, I absolutely see that the 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 potential difference but i think i don't know i think the script at that time i read is already very good i don't know how good he can make another script you know but maybe same script with another director with another actress again the you you it's not easy to find an actor like this to play the female role yeah so it'll be a casting challenge again, yeah it will be difficult too yeah 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 so then let's go move to uh, the the cloud atlas cloud atlas, cloud atlas. The, This is the Cloud Atlas sextet. I doubt there's more than a handful of copies in all of North America. But I know it. I know I know it. That's it. The music from my dream. There are whole movements I wrote imagining us meeting again and again in different lives, in different ages. I can't explain it. But I knew when I opened that door, a powerful déjà vu ran through my bones. I heard it in a dream, as in a nightmarish cafe, and the waitresses they all had the same face. No reason to hide. I know you are Sonny Four Five One. Yesterday, my life was headed in one direction. Today, it is headed in another. You ever think the universe is against you? Fear, <laughs> belief, love, phenomena that determine the course of our lives. These forces begin long before we are born and continue after we perish. This is the first project I raise money, you know, 
before. And uh, I have never done that before. But I actually was successfully raised 30 million US dollars for this movie, and which is represent 30% more. Uh, well, the budget is eventually, it was 110 million. So I was able to raise 30 million in, in Asia. So why actually, I love the book. I don't know how many of you have read the book. Yeah, some of them, yeah, I love the book. I like, this is the kind of story that I mentioned, you know, this uh, uh, Mishima book is about reincarnation. For me, I believe the philosophy behind it is like everything is connected, everything is related, you know. So I, it, it was, uh, I, of course, I know a lot uh, the Wachowski before that, you know, we were friends. And I don't know Tom Tickwell, you know, but then after, you know, I am a big fan of all their works, you know. So when I first met them in Los Angeles, all together like a round ta table, because they have problem with the, with the studio at the time, so I, they asked if I'm confident in raising that money. I, I have never done that before, but I loved it. But I do believe, you know, if I loved it, you know, I, even though I, don't, I have never done that before, I should be able to convince the others. So fair enough, I was able to f convince others. But for some known and unknown reason, I'm sure you know that the movie actually did not do that work well in the US. And, uh, you know, because, you know, so they think that the movie is, they don't know what sort of genre it is. You know, for the, a, a lot of American filmmaker or, or, or industry people, they always want to define what is this genre. For us, this, this movie has a lot of genre. For them, this is a, something very unusual. So that is the, um, uh, the reason, um, you know, uh, somehow we have to do it independently. But instead, you know, originally Warner Brothers was involved more, but later on, it's a deal change. They only distribute the movie. So when they saw the movie apparently, they are not, they don't know the movie that well enough. They don't know how to market it. So the, the, the movie did not do well in the US, but the movie did quite well internationally, including China. So my, my working relationship with uh, uh, the Wachowski is fantastic. And you know, I, before I came over here, I was in Chicago just talking with, 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 with Lorna, you know, so about our potential collaboration in the future. So you see, that's uh, Cloud Atlas. We have three directors, you know, two units shooting at the same time in Berlin. The actors are all in Berlin, you know. There are six stories in Cloud Atlas, you know. Three by Lorna and Andy Wachowski. Now it's not Lorna, it's a Lily Wachowski. Lorna and Lily Wachowski. Another one is by Tom Tickwell. The, the actors are all in Berlin. So one day you go to a, uh, Unit A, one day you go to Unit B. It's a fantastic experience for me, you know. So, I, I, I mean, working with Lorna Wachowski, I have to say, because I spend more time with Lorna and, uh, other than uh, uh, Tom. Tom is, a, of course, a very, Tom Tickwell is a very talented person. I found Lorna is very interesting, very passionate about what she's doing. And then she, one thing is that she only like complicated stories. When you look at Cloud uh, Matrix, you know, it's still very complicated, you know, but it's amazing. So Cloud Atlas is very complicated for a lot of people, but I don't know how many of you have seen it. I think, I think it's not that complicated. If you really spend time, sit down, and be patient to look at uh, to, to watch the movie. So for me, this is the, my best experience so far, by far, the best movie I have ever involved. You've said that, uh, you know, coming to themes, uh, you know, themes that are uh, sort of, uh, in a way, uh, with some roots in Asia, you said that this film had the theme of reincarnation because the same characters are going through thousands of years of history and they play different characters. You know, in one life, maybe he's a man and then the same character plays the woman. You know, a male character playing a woman and vice versa, if I'm not wrong. So was that the main reason for you to get involved in the project because of the theme? The theme was uh, so philosophical? Oh, yes. And basically because I believe that. You know, because I believe 
my previous life, I could be a white man. Next life, I could be a woman. You know, this is something I strongly believe. You know, Tom Hanks at one point, he said, oh, I don't know what they are thinking, what they are doing, but I loved it, you know. So he, don't he does not necessarily understand the philosophy. You know, I, I, on the other hand, I want to show you Tom Hanks. I saw an uh, interview with Tom Hanks, right, uh, just a few months ago. He was doing this movie about this pilot landing in uh, Solid, right? I haven't seen the movie. And he said, the, all the, 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 the reporter asked him, so you have done a lot of movie. Do, what do you think when you go back at home and you watch your movie? He said, I never watch my movie except Cloud Atlas. I have seen it many times. It's, it's a kind of movie that people don't understand right now, but many, many years later, it will be a classic. And I do believe that Cloud Atlas is, is, is a movie like that. And, and as I'm quoted and talked many times, you know, uh, Chris Nolan lo wrote uh, Lorna a letter uh, later on. He said the movie is fantastic, but only one big problem. It's two, 20 years too early. I think it's maybe for the, for the American audience, yes. But the movie did extremely well in Russia, just that you know. So it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and of course, you know, another thing, the movie was actually did not do well. Everybody lost their money in China, but I'm still very good friend with everybody. Because <laughs> I, I have to say, that is something very important. You know why? Because I told them at day one, you know, this is the cast that we have, this is the director. We will do our best to make the best possible movie. Whether the movie make money or not, we don't know. There's certain things we don't know. We will just do our best. And this is still up to this moment. This is how I approach every single project. So that's why if I don't like the project, I cannot get involved because I don't have that sort of passion to c carry on and keep pushing it to the, to the best. So uh, moving on now, let's look at your latest project, Assassin's Creed, which comes out at Christmas time. Uh, now, again, this is the superhero story genre, which is right now sort of dominating the film business worldwide. And these kind of films are doing quite well in China as well. Uh, so uh, I think we'll play the trailer. Yeah, yeah. can then, you play the trailer can, a little yeah, bit? Play the trailer of Assassin's Creed. You're here to save my soul. I understand it's your birthday. <laughs> yeah. The party's just getting started. His name is Callum Lynch. We've traced his bloodline back 500 years to the Assassin's Creed. Cal, as anyone in the world knows or cares, you no longer exist. What is this place? This is your second chance. What do you want from me? Your past. You're about to enter the Animus. What you see, hear and feel are the memories of your ancestor, who's been dead for 500 years. Wait a minute! Welcome to the Spanish Inquisition. This is my Watching you, waiting to see who you are. Trust me, this is gonna I believe you are destined for great things. Let's find out. This is my world. We work in the dark to serve the light. I'm beginning to like this. Thank you, thank you. 
So the movie will be released December 22nd in India, so please support the movie. <laughs> so it's very simple. When I first heard about this movie, I knew nothing about this project. Game, I never play games. So I had my, asked my cousin, uh, my, my, my nephew, yeah, to go with his friend, his, because he's, he's doing game design, to come and tell me what the story is. So I know the story, I think it's fantastic. So of course, and then I went to see the director who directed his previous film was a small one called Macbeth. So I went to see Macbeth. I read the script, I like it. I went to see Macbeth, I can visualize how the film will look like. And together with Michael Spreadfrender, Maria Cordier, and also uh, with Jeremy Irons, my favorites. So I think that will be a movie that it will be exciting. The same thing. So pretty much I approach, say, that we, I put up also, help to put up a substantial amount of uh, you know, money for this movie. For me, that sort of the movie that I'm not necessarily uh, uh, in love with that sort of movie, but I think it's a good quality movie that entertaining. A lot of people, they have a very good, a big fan base, you know. So I think the movie, actually I saw the, the first cut, is fantastic, yeah. I think it will be, like Assassin's Creed 2 and Assassin's Creed 3 in the it's future. Like a, it's like a franchise. You yes, see that as like a franchise, a franchise for sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. Now, uh, talking about cultures again, uh, you know, like China, India also has a very rich history in mythology and epics. We have the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. But I think the Indian film industry is still uh, sort of coming uh, or trying to tap that potential of the epic, you know, an epic from India that can cross cultures. You know, we have seen that coming from China, but India is still trying that. Last year we had uh, sort of a, a indication with the success of Bahubali. So, uh, in your opinion, how can Indian films and Indian stories travel across across cultures? And what kind of a project would you like to pursue in India with an Indian theme uh, that could be something like that, like an epic that grows uh, that goes across cultures? Well, I, I think first of all, I have to admit that I don't understand the industry. I don't know the industry in India well enough. I have been here eight years ago trying to do a movie with a very talented filmmaker, uh, Bala, you know. Bala, yeah. yeah. So, but then for some reason we were unable to do it. So I still, you know, looking for this opportunity to do a, in, a film in India. But my experience is that, you know, I, I, my experience is that you have to find something exciting, interesting. You have to think outside the box, you know. Particularly there's a culture issue. We have to be open. Again, I, I want to show you something uh, as a, a Chinese movie. Uh, that it's a, I, I, will, I will try to see if I can demonstrate the importance of our culture, you know, how it affects the movie business. Jin Fire. 
Ten years ago, I, I, a friend of mine told me about this uh, material, is this material. So it was on the internet. So uh, because that's, you know, uh, I, I shouldn't say it right. So it's on the internet. I read it. I loved it. I actually went to Shanghai together with my lawyer, tried to option the right of the book, right? So at that time, you know, ten years ago, that sort of right is much easier. Not now, right? So I, 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 we've been negotiating. Uh, but then people tell, said, you know, well, you will never make, get, make, this, uh, make this movie because it's about ghosts. Ghost story is not allowed to, after this, I, I mean, sort of about ghosts up to this moment. And then, and then, and, and you know, but I, I see it differently. But I see, at that time, I said, well, 10 years later, I don't know what's going on, you know. But I love the story. The story is about like a tomb raider, about some ghosts, and also about feng shui, right? So I think it could be very interesting. So I still try to, to pursue that, right? And at that time, I don't have a lot of money. I still use my US way. I try to option it to make a deal with the writer. But then one day I was in Hong Kong at that time I was teaching a friend of mine said oh there's a guy from Shanghai want to meet with you you know you should meet him he's my friend so I met with him and then he asked me what you want to do I said oh, oh that's a, I'm tr I'm working on this project I'm trying to option option this you know I think about a few weeks later I realized that the the guy stopped the the publisher stopped talking to me because this guy paid one million renminbi and get the right it's very bad right. So, then, but he is not smart enough. He's not smart enough because he bought all the books the writer wrote at that time. So, like four books. He tried to make that a movie, announce it to have a director in Hong Kong, but never get made. But many years later, another director who made this movie and optioned the, the fifth to the eight books. The fifth and the eight books. So, so he made that movie. Then this guy who optioned the first four books and tried to make the same movie, similar. So pretty much at the same time, two, story, two movie about this story came up. And of course, this movie did very well. Right. This movie, did, the other one did not do well. So what I want to say here is that, for me, I, I think this movie did, you don't believe it, make close to 300 million US dollar in China itself. But the movie did not travel. I have kept been thinking, you know, first I learned lesson, you never tell people what you are doing. Don't tell them what you are thinking. So people sometimes, you just need to be very careful. And secondly, is that when you option, you should option all, everything. This writer is going to write about this. So this is something, you know, I optioned three books recently. So I optioned the first and the second book. The third book is, has, has not been written, but I still optioned the whole thing. So I think it's a very important, at that time, I, I think it's a, because I, even though I don't know what's going on 10 years later, you know, I have to think ahead. What's going on in the future? I don't know, but what I like right now, what I think of what would happen in the future, I try to, to pursue it. So that's why I think there's certain kind of uh, Indian culture. Right now, I don't know, but you know better than I do. If there's something that you think it will be interesting, it will right, right now may not be good, the timing is not good, you may do it later. So the same thing is right now, you know, I am doing a film. I, the reason I'm very excited about it, I want to do this project with Bala. You know, I think it will be very exciting. We will do something that people have not seen before. And there's a certain culture, not necessarily the Western audience understand. We, I think we will try to say something that easier enough for them to understand and they will find interesting and exciting. That is the kind of thing I want to do. That will be something that we are all looking forward to as a great uh, India-China co-production. Uh, before we open the question, uh, the audience uh, for questions, just one last question. I mean, you know, you started in the business, uh, you said you wanted to be a director. 
Would you like to now pursue direction now that you have so much fantastic experience as a producer and with working with so many directors? No, I don't actually because I'm very lazy. So, and, and also I'm very greedy. I'm very greedy because, well, just that, you know, when I went to, I, I, talk, I told some uh, uh, people yesterday, I went to AFI, you know, I spent the first year there, the second year I was invited as a director because going to AFI directing program is very difficult, but I have to decline it because I think I have the potential to be a good director, but being a director, you have to be very concentrated. You have to be very focused on something. I believe a good director. I don't have that sort of patience. I am the kind of person, I, I'm very greedy. I want to do a lot of things. I want the, oh, I fell in love with something very quickly. You know, if I fell in love with it, I want to do it. So that's why I'm not the, uh, the great quality as a director. You know, maybe someday in the future, you never know, I have a lot of money, the project come out right, I, I want to do it. But I still prefer to work with talented director. And because I tell you, it's very exciting to work with smart people. Yeah, that's great. We look forward to your... You can be rest assured, I think the whole world will be looking forward to your directorial debut, that's for sure. So now uh, we invite the audience for questions and uh, hope we can keep them short and simple. Instead of epic questions, I think let's have short questions. Yes, on the screen, you can start off with that. Obviously, you have a vast uh, experience. Can you give us an idea of what you look for in a script? What tells you the first page, the first chapter, I mean, the first 10 pages? What is it about a script that actually works? Because here there are a lot of young filmmakers and script writers, and it's so difficult to translate what's on the paper, what happened on the screen, especially for a first-time director where you have no image referencing. I, I think actually is a is a very interesting question. You know, I I was reading a script this morning. I woke up at six thirty to read the script because I promised a friend of mine I have to read it today, right? So I w still was unable to read it. I I found it. You know, first of all, for me, I I want to get engaged in the first few pages. What it is, you know, whether you have interesting character, whether I care about them or not. So like to this morning's experience is that I shall share with you. After like 20 pages, I find I have to read it, but I'm not that excited about it. But then, the more I read about it, the more I find it, I want to know the end. But then, it is something that I think the filmmaker, the writer, have to be very careful because a lot of people, they just have no time to read it. After five pages, don't know what you are talking about. They throw it away. But there are scripts that I read. The more you read about it, the more you want, want to know about it. I tell you, the Talents Malik script, it's just little by little, little by little, and draw you by the end of the day, you want to cry. So this is a different kind of uh, talent or expertise. I mean, it's just that, you know, I think one, you know, as a first time or young upcoming, most likely you should try to, to engage the reader as soon as possible. That's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? Uh, uh, I just have a quick question, uh, me as a first time filmmaker. Uh, I want to ask if the Chinese investor, are they only interested in the science fiction big budget movie or also in the independent cinema? Well, I have to say at this moment, yes. You know. Uh, well, always investors, you know, but for them, the most easier one, you know, it could be bigger movie, Hollywood movie, uh, you know, but it's not necessarily true nowadays. Things change. As I mentioned to you, I, I, I do believe, right, uh, I sometimes I don't really care what they are looking for or what they want to invest. I have to ask myself what I want to do. What I want to do is that, is the project I want to do, I have to be very well prepared when I go out there and sell them. I don't give them a try. Huh? I try not to give them a reason to say no. So 
the issue is that you know there's nothing really obvious. Yeah, there are, everything is obvious. You know, oh, everybody tell you, oh, you have a movie with Tom Cruise. You know, you have Steven Spielberg. They want to invest. The the issue is that you know there are a lot of investor looking for projects, good projects. There are a lot of filmmaker looking for investment. There's always sometimes it's a it's a problem in demand, but the demand is really about excellency, in my opinion. It's a good project. Whether or not, you know, you know, right now, yes, they only want to do big, big projects. But I do believe if you have something exciting, it's viable, it makes sense, they're bound to be investor in China. What this one, you know, just that, you know, every day, they said, this day they made hundreds and hundreds of movies in China. But every year, maybe only 100 or 200 movies get released. A lot of them just like, a, you know, zero in, you know, investment, it's total loss. But again, they said China is big. Today, the investor from Guangdong die. Tomorrow, the one in Shanghai comes. You know, it's just come and go, come and go. But I think as a filmmaker, you know, you, you just need to be, to have to make, you have to make sure your project is outstanding and people has to invest. At least you have to think that way. If you don't have that sort of motivation, that is not good enough. Any other questions? I've always wondered about the connection between what we call an epic film and its budget. Uh, we are embarking on an international film in English, the co-production with UK, Poland, and India. I'm the producer and the writer. We're doing it on a seven and a half million dollar budget. But traditionally, a Hollywood film, which is considered to be an epic film, would be a 30, 40, 50, 100 million dollar film. Uh, to me, an epic film is David Lean, uh, Roman Polanski, and sometimes I think an epic film is epic in its content and the cinematographer and the director's vision, but it doesn't require a 30 or a 40 million dollar budget. Uh, you've done so many wonderful epic films, and uh, if you could shed some light on this correlation between um, uh, of the budget and, and the visual scale of a film, and can just a cinematographer do it? You don't really need a hundred million dollar budget. Thank you. Okay, let me try to answer this. Yeah, for me, well, as I mentioned, there well some some movie are bigger than yeah they are big. You know, you can call them epic. For me, if this a movie itself is has to be big, it has to be big. If it has to be small, it has to be small. But there are people, I just tell you, this day, try to make big movie, to make themselves look great. And I, I, I don't know, because it is the story de decided. An epic, I want to tell you that in, in the US right now, an epic, most likely you're talking about 80 million, or maybe more. 30, 40 million is low budget. Yeah, so things change. I have that discussion with Nai earlier about what is an epic in India. It's about 10 to 15 million, right? Yeah. I think it, by the end of the day, it really depends on the market and your audience. You know? As I mentioned, I went to film school a totally of seven years, you know? my undergrad and graduate school. I made movie with $500, $2,000. My AFI graduation project, $50,000. I got an Emmy Award for for producer for, the, for this graduation project. I, what I want to say is that, you know, I can do movie with all sort of budget. It really depends on the audience. It also depends on your material. So I, I don't know, you know, if you want to do an epic, you have to make sure, you know, it makes sense. You have that sort of an audience for you, you know, to recruit your investment. Justify the cost. Yes. Justify. You have to be responsible for the, the, the investor. This is the first thing you have to do as an independent producer. I have to say a lot of directors I work with, you know, first time director, they don't care. They, for, for them is that the key is that they have to make sure the movie will get some awards overseas, you know. I tell you there are free, a few thousands of awards. That sort of award sometimes does not mean a lot, you know, to you. But I think the key is that, you know, you, you just have to make sure your who are exactly are your audience? If it is a commercial, uh, is a commercial activity, you have to make sure that you would be able to get your investment, at least on paper. Yeah. You know, I, I tell you, like the Cloud Atlas. No, we we don't 
we don't cheat people, so to speak. We are very honest, you know. There's certain, that sort of genre, you don't have previous, uh, you know, models, you know. But uh, again, as I said, you know, it, uh, we are very responsible person. That's why I keep getting, you know, people keep believing in me, so to speak. Yeah. They come, keep, they have sort of confidence to come back to you, yeah. Uh, we're sort of running out of time. Maybe one last question. Good evening. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for such an engaging discussion. Uh, my question is, uh, we see so much of the focus is turning towards the East. From earlier, the focus being in the West and Hollywood. Now, so countries like China and India, there's really a lot of focus of the world. So what would your advice be to the youth uh, in, in countries like India and China? What should their focus be? if they're aspiring to be uh, producers like yourself. You mean for Indian and China co-production? Not co-production, but... but no, if, if within India and China, upcoming producers in both countries, you know, what can they learn from you? I, I, no, I, please, you know, not learn from me, but my belief is that don't try to be greedy. You know, there are people try to be greedy, think that they want to make a movie that works everywhere. I think you, for me, the key is that you have to make sure your movie is being successful in your local country, in your local market. You know, I think as a producer, I, 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 I said, you know, I, as I mentioned, you know, I tried to, to take out something that is not everyday people. You know, for example, right now, I was asked, you know, what sort of Chinese movie I want to make. Right now, I don't want to make any because I could not find anything interesting. Because all the movie now sell sold in um, receive big box office are the movie that pretty much the same sort of a genre, right? I am developing something Chinese. I'm working on something Chinese, but I take time. I develop it in the right timing. Yeah, a right, right, right project. I don't want to follow the flow. I want to. Not to create. I want to. Cr I, I want to lead the flow. I don't just don't want to follow. I, I think it's a good idea, you know, to to think outside the box, you know, something that's obvious but yet they are not obvious. I don't know if I have answered your question, but I. <laughs> I think people will get the gist that you know the more offbeat you are, probably. You know, you are on the right road if you're more offbeat. I think that's, it's, it's a bit of a Zen thing. That, that's what I would say. So a big round of applause for Mr. Lee, and uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you very much.